with either specific learning difficulties such as dyslexia or for students with low vision. Okay? Now, what we're going to be talking about are practical solutions to support these type of students in every context of education. Not just higher education, further education, secondary education, and even to a certain extent, primary education. So, our aims in this are to go beyond secular supports, okay, as broad as possible. So, when designing this particular workshop, we're, we're quite flexible, as in all of our activities. It can be a one-hour workshop, it can be a two-hour workshop, or it can be a whole-day workshop. And today, we have a guest in the room, Mr. AJ. And AJ is going to act as our student. AJ is currently a student of NCI. He is a master's student, hoping towards a PhD in specific areas. AJ has an interest in inclusive education and in particular has worked with me on a number of papers on research in, in inclusive education and learning technologies. He's a great guy and I really, really, really appreciate you coming in here today. And we'll be joined by Sarah who's going to help us out in terms of evaluating as well. You know, join now, Sarah, I must also mention at this stage I will not be alone in this presentation. Um, Eva has kindly offered her support in designing this particular workshop and she is going to be conducting part of the end of this actual workshop in relation to kinesthetic learning okay, and in particular a fun element of the day itself. So, in terms of our goals for Roborella Smart, let us think for a moment and introduce the concept to AJ and to Sarah. What were we trying to do when we came together as a consortium, as a number of like-minded individuals working in inclusive education? What did we want to do to support students across the sectors? And the objective of this project was to develop and complete a suite of workshops that could be combined into a practical and scalable course in inclusive education and in particular with elements of practical skills, knowledge and dispositions towards an inclusive environment for students. And the course itself has a number of different sections. The last time we met we had a really powerful presentation by Sven that gave us an overview of the motivation behind what we do as a group of individuals. And as part of designing this course, we decided as a group to have certain case studies that should be incorporated into our final course. So stories such as Sven's, our own insights into what the education sectors are like, into what supports are like, and how disabilities and specific learning difficulties can affect individuals. So all of these combinations together. And part of our course is also designing accessible documents, such as Word documents, PDFs, so that all students can benefit from them in an equitable manner, not just students with no disabilities at all. Today's session is going to be on using learning technology to support students with dyslexia, SBLDs, specific learning difficulties, and students with low vision or VI difficulties. Other workshops that we've also designed are daisy conversions, ebook conversions, and finally braille conversions. So they are the elements of what we have done together as a group in terms of putting together good supports. And we're going to package them in a very accessible manner and a very consistent manner so that when we finally put this course up on whatever forum that we're going to do so, then they all will have the same level of effectiveness, learning outcomes and assessments associated with them. So our students today are going to take part in the workshop. They're going to be doing some practical demonstrations and they're going to help us evaluate the workshop itself. Okay, so here is the overview of today's workshop, what we're going to do. So we're going to firstly present an overview of low vision and dyslexia, because remember, these workshops are designed 
not specifically for people who are experts in the area, like ourselves, but who may be parents of students with VIs or dyslexia, new teachers, new alternative media creators, or people interested in supporting students. So we must always keep that in mind. We're not always going to be teaching to ourselves and to others. We're going to be teaching people that are fresh to the actual element itself. So we're going to give a small insight into how low vision and dyslexia can affect the educational well-being of our students. We're also going to look at some traditional supports for dyslexia and for students with low vision in college settings, in school settings and other social settings. Now, more importantly, we're also going to be looking at some, not all, but some smart solutions to support these type of students. And we're going to cover three areas, as I mentioned. Auditory learning, learning from our ears, visual learning from our eyes, and kinesthetic learning. And we're going to combine those three elements together in what we hope will be an effective workshop for people who are supporting their sons or their daughters or new to the actual elements of inclusive education. The four student exercises that we're going to be doing will be for AJ and Sarah to create an MP3 file using RoboBraille. We're all so used to using RoboBraille that sometimes we forget that some people have A, never heard of our services, and B, do not know the impact and the full potential of Global Breath. So we're going to go through how they can use that themselves. We'll also facilitate them to create a mind map of their choice and we'll discuss what actual mind maps are and their effectiveness for supporting students in education. We'll also give an overview how you can create a narrated slideshow in PowerPoint which is also combining visual and auditory learning. And finally, students and perhaps all of us will learn some basic juggling techniques to improve coordination, which Eva is going to help us kind of present later on today. And not only that, not only is juggling fun, but there's a real psychological connection between the dexterity of how we use our hands and how dyslexia affects our left and right hand brain. Am I right in saying that? So we're going to help coordination through the act of juggling as well. And finally, we're going to have a student evaluation whereby I want you to think in terms of how we roll out the course itself, new ideas, new insights, and I'll combine that in a short kind of survey tomorrow and we'll present back to the actual group itself. Okay, so whilst we're going through this, have a think about the use of the tools, the layout of the actual activities, and how we can improve upon what we're doing as well. I really appreciate that. Okay. So, the first part of this workshop will be an overview of low vision or visual impairments and the challenges it can cause for learning. So, as the term states, low vision itself is a loss of eyesight that makes everyday tasks difficult. And we don't have to imagine hard how that can affect people, not just in the classroom but in everyday lives, such as reading, writing, talking with somebody, shopping, watching television, driving a car. Every element of our lives are affected by the quality of our vision and the impairments that are associated with low vision or visual impairments. Now, the goal of this workshop is not for us to become experts in VI disability or visual impairments, but to have an, a small understanding of the types of impacts that it can create for people. And more importantly, how us as educators can help those particular end students. So in terms of the challenges that low vision can provide or that can um, affect people, it can affect their central vision, which can be seen here. So this is a clock. Your central vision is whereby you direct your focus of your attention to an object or a series of objects. And with a visual impairment or a low VI, you are actually faced with not having a full picture. It can be clouded, it can be dark, it can be in some way impaired. As well as that with our peripheral vision, the outside of an actual focus point can be blurred or can be some way subdued. 
so that our whole field of vision is totally, totally affected. And of course, that small insight isn't the full extent of what can actually happen through the result of the eye impairment. We can have contrast sensitivity, so distinguishing between the size of objects, the distinction of objects itself, depth perception as well. So new vision loss in one eye can affect depth perception, such as the height, the step. Um, visual impairment in one eye can lead to uh, coordination challenges, driving challenges, and everyday actual activities, such as opening doors or um, escalating stairs. Um, it can also affect our visual processing techniques insofar as our ability to recognize physical objects, to manipulate physical objects, and how we interpret objects through color, through depth, and through the sound of touch, and through the, the feel of touch as well. And um, so any challenges or any difficulties or impairments in these areas can affect our overall manipulation of everyday objects, not just school activities. Some of the most common occurrences or causes of low vision or vision impairments are uncorrected refractor errors, which accounts for quite a lot, um, cataracts and glaucoma. And as a small workshop, we're not expecting to take away all of this knowledge, which is why these workshops will be recorded and materials will be provided both in advance and reusable for students themselves. So at the end of this, you're never going to remember the full elements of the challenges of VRs, but in some way, you can take with you how it can affect you in an educational setting. So that's what we're hoping to combat against. In an educational setting, what can we do to help? Now, moving on from VI, low and vision, to the concept of SPLDs, or what's commonly known as specific learning difficulties. And the most common form of that in students is dyslexia. And at this point, we'll introduce a small concept of dyslexia, the challenges of dyslexia, how it's diagnosed as well. So dyslexia is a reading, writing, and spelling difficulty that may be caused by phonological visual and auditory weaknesses. Word retrieval and speed of processing as well as memory and organizational weaknesses may also be prevalent. That's just one definition. But as we all know, who work with students with specific learning difficulties, dyslexia or any form of specific learning difficulty can affect individuals in multiple ways. And we're going to look at some of those now. And again, keeping in mind how we can support these students. Dyslexia can occur at any level of intellectual ability. It is in no way a reflection of how smart a person is or the challenges a person has in relation to their IQ levels. Sometimes, however, that is miscalculated and misrepresented in both the media and in society. That people get confused that if a person has trouble reading, writing, or spelling, that perhaps their IQ is lower. And that is a fallacy that we as a group just want to highlight straight away that that is not the case. In some way to kind of visualize that. Have either of you ever seen that curve before? Anybody ever seen this curve? Yes, yes of course you have. Yes. So it's called the normal bell curve. And in society, if you were to take a hundred random people, chances are that most people, 50 of those hundred people, would score in the middle, or the mean, which is why we always have the vertical line at the top of the bell curve. Some people will perform below, and some people will perform above the bell curve itself. Now, what a psychologist does when they are hoping to diagnose a specific learning difficulty is they perform a battery of tests. They perform word reading tests, spelling tests, comprehension tests to determine how a person reads a passage, understands the meaning, spells individual words, and takes meaning from it itself. And what they then do is they combine the results of those tests with an intelligence test. And your intelligence test, has anybody ever taken an intelligence test before? Yes? Yes? Okay. So what intelligence test does, it tests your ability to cognitively process information. How quickly you process information, how accurately you process information, 
to determine how fast and accurate your engine works. Okay, so it's kind of think of it like that, how fast and accurate your mind works. So, when a psychologist performs all of these tests, what they then do, they look at whether there's a discrepancy or a difference between these type of tests and the intelligence test. And if there's in any way a gap between those, then a psychologist has the opportunity to label a difficulty as being dyslexic or specific learning difficulty. So that's a short insight into how that is diagnosed itself. But what we're most concerned about is not the diagnosis element, but the supports. How that we can help students overcome the challenges. And the challenges are just not in relation to reading and writing. But you can see a number of the different types of challenges, such as erratic spelling, structuring, planning and organizing, ordering items sequentially, also, sometimes the difference between left and right. Very simple errors that affect your day-to-day -day life. Transferring thoughts into paper, mispronouncing words, quite commonly mixing up letters such as D and B. Has anybody ever come across that before, looking at letters being mispronounced and misunderstood? Now, AJ works quite closely with a lot of students with disabilities and students with dyslexia. Have you ever come across any elements of these challenges in your day-to-day -day working life, AJ? With students? Some of them, yeah. Yeah. Some of them are more common Some than others. Yeah, absolutely. And what we always establish is that dyslexia affects people in different ways. But what's the great thing about the concept of disabilities and specific learning difficulties is that some people actually not so. Everybody can develop strengths. And it's the strengths that we want to support. So there's different mechanisms of support that you put in place, that I put in place to support students with disabilities. And we can help motivate them to use technologies and strategies to overcome specific challenges. And that's the beautiful thing about what we do in inclusive education, is that we can help people overcome those particular challenges. Okay, now, traditional supports for students with either specific learning difficulties or visual impairments. Now, if I was to go around the room, those types of supports will differ, because in every country we do things slightly different. I can only speak in this case in a broader sense. For students with disabilities or specific learning difficulties, one very common support put in place is called learning support. Hands up who's ever heard of learning support. Okay, yes, yeah, so there's a few. Okay, so the concept of learning support in a number of countries that I've visited is outside of the classroom. So a student who has either a disability or a specific learning difficulty goes to a designated academic tutor to supplement the learning that goes in the classroom, such as reading strategies, note-taking strategies, exam strategies, time management. And if you've ever worked with a student with dyslexia before, you'll notice time management is a big challenge for them. To be able to organize their time, their assignments, and get things in on time. I'm sure you've had plenty of students that have just been very chaotic and come to you for support. Now, in the realm of VIs and specific learning difficulties, there are a number of technologies which we call assistive technologies. Hands up who's heard of assistive technologies. Yes, of course. We, we've, all, we've all heard of assistive technologies. And AJ, you, you've, you've probably helped students use assistive technologies. And Sarah, you'd be somewhat aware of these as well. Now, assistive technologies originally were put in place to specifically support students with a disability or specific learning difficulty. Now, even though that's a great thing, that's a fantastic achievement from both a welfare perspective and from a humanitarian perspective, it's great that we have those technologies. But what they do is, unfortunately, some of these technologies, such as Zoom text, Dragon Naturally Speaking, Read and Write Gold, Inspiration, all of these are fantastic. But what they tend to do is segregate students into you have a disability, and this is a package designed for you. 
and what we hope to provide for students as part of our consortium and as part of our collective consciousness, if you will, is to provide solutions that just do not benefit students with VI difficulties or specific learning difficulties, but benefit everybody in the classroom. So when we talk of universal design theory, when we talk of universal pedagogy, we're hoping to be grouped in those conversations. So what we do is not just for the betterment of one or two individuals, but for everybody. So that's what we're trying to do. Which is why when we came together as a group, we decided that we would create SMART, Robo Braille SMART, a collection of strategies, technologies, and thoughts and beliefs collected together to formulate an understanding that a student learns in many different ways. Not just one way, but advances over time. And they learn in an auditory fashion, hearing, speaking, possibly visual learning, images, visual spatial sketchbook, which is somewhere here, whereby you look at something, you close your eyes, and you try to imagine the same image. And through kinesthetic learning, I'm not going to spoil what you're going to do. I'm not going to talk a lot about kinesthetic learning, but it's a form of learning whereby you transcend traditional books and writing and listening, but it's more about how you interact with your environment and how by using tools that your memory and your brain can learn different things. And in fact, you can become a more strategic thinker, you can perform tasks that you couldn't do before simply by learning new physical skills. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what we hope to do is that these types of technologies will not just help the one or two students in the classroom that may have a disability, but will help everybody to start learning and thinking in different ways. So that we can together as a group facilitate what we have called flexible learning. Okay, so that's what we're hoping to facilitate. And what we mean by that, there's a number of technologies that we're going to look at, such as traditional note taking, auditory learning through global breath, mind map creation. Now, obviously, having worked closely with me over the last few years, you'll be aware of some of these technologies. But a student coming in with no information, that's what we're trying to kind of parcel these packages together. Easy step-by-step -step processes combined with problem-based learning so that they can follow a path that is easy and step-by-step. -step. And what do we mean by flexible learning? So a student can study on the go, study on the couch, and my personal favorite, study in bed. <laughs> That's how I sell these technologies to my students. Not in a monetary sense, but an actual a sense of using them. You do not have to always study by reading a book, by writing down notes. You can study simply by listening to your notes on the way to college, in the gym, I don't like money, <laughs> or you can sit back on your couch or your chair and relax and listen. And we have statistically proven or argued that a student who relies on these types of technologies will do better than their peers that do not use these technologies. In fact, grades have been shown to jump at least 15%. So there's a big margin there. Now, this is where students always question me. How can you study when you're going to sleep? And it, re it relates back to a lot of hypnotic suggestion and unconscious learning. And there's a whole body of thought around that. If you're listening to your words and to your paragraphs and to your hypothesis and your statements, over and over again, even if it's not fully conscious, there is arguments there that it's going into what's called a phonological loop, which is located somewhere. And if the more times you hear it, it will come back to you when you need it, for instance, in an exam scenario. And our students believe this, and they use it. So, combining those strategies, auditory learning, visual learning, kinesthetic learning, 
what we're going to do today is simple. We're going to create audio notes using Rovabra. We're going to create mind maps using various different types of mind maps. We're going to look at some simple ones and we're going to create an array of slideshow. Very simple step by step and you're going to be doing a lot of the work. But I'm going to be here as a facilitator to help if you need me to do some help with that. And keep in mind that when we are delivering these types of workshops, there will be students in our classroom that will go on ahead of everybody else because that's natural. Some people will just go along and do it, whereas other people will need some guidance. And that's okay too, which goes back to our approach of being flexible. We have to be flexible in how we deliver these types of programs. Okay. Now, for students, and this is not just students with dyslexia or specific learning difficulty or vision impairment, for students who learn best through auditory forms or oral forms, there are some free tools which we can use to create an MP3 version of your notes. So I want you to think of that. If a student has a Word document, if a student has a PDF document, if a student has a text file or a file that they've received from the lecturers and they want to transform that into an auditory piece, an MP3 file. Traditionally, if we don't have rubber rail, they can either pay for that type of thing or they can use a package such as Read and Write Gold or Dragon Naturally Speaking or something that costs quite a lot of money. But through this service, of Robert Group, we can provide that free of charge in a very effective way. So what I'm going to ask is that we're going to do that today. We're going to help you create one of those files today. And we're going to be looking. And so what I want you to do is open up your web browsers. It doesn't matter which browser you use, just open up any web browser. And I want you to visit www.robobrail.org. Okay, so that's what I'd like you to do first. Now, obviously, if we're running this for a class of people, you can have them create a Word file in advance, or you can have a file for them to use. Now, in this case, I would bet my life that both AJ and Sarah have at least one Word document on their laptops that they can exploit and that they can use. Please tell me you do. I'm sure you do. Okay. So, we're going to be using whatever Word document they use, because in this case, the content is not important. The demonstration of skill is important, that they can navigate the website itself. So, have we gone to Loverbrill? Yeah, perfect. Now, if you look at the step-by-step -step instructions of Loverbrill, it's very easy to use. It's designed so that as many people as possible can use it. So, step one is to upload the file. So, you select your file and upload it to the server. And you can see that there's a number of different documents there that can be uploaded. The most common documents that I have seen students upload are PDF documents and Word documents. So I would suggest using either PDF or Word document for the case of this demonstration. So you upload a file of your choice and it will then give you a series of options. Now, at this point, if you're the facilitator of this session, if you're the teacher delivering this module, you can then go around the room and make sure everybody is doing and coping with the task ahead. So in this case, I'm simply asking, is everything okay, you're doing all right? Everything's okay, you're doing okay. So, I'm going, yes, you're uploading file, perfect. Now, it's important to highlight for students at this point that the rubber braille delivery is not, it's not synchronous, it's not instantaneous. There is a short, small delay in getting back the actual document itself. If I was to ask Lars, what type of expected time should we indicate to people? 15 minutes, 10 minutes? It really depends on the size of the document that you're submitting. So if it's just a few pages up to like 10 pages, then you should expect to hear back from the service within 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, that's no, a no, no later than that. Yeah. If it's a huge chunk uh, that needs to be OCR processed first yes. and then subsequently converted into an audio book, it may take a couple of hours. Okay. Now, what I tend to do when I'm, when I'm delivering this to students is I give them that expectation. If your document is a short enough document as a series of lecture notes, 
or notes that you've typed out yourself, you can expect to hear back as soon as 10 or 15 minutes, okay? And I always suggest you using your personal email addresses rather than, let's say, a college email address. Because sometimes, as we know, some institutions have firewalls that can prevent files from being delivered and emails being delivered. So always, when possible, use your personal email address. Now, I would typically give students about five to ten minutes to complete that exercise. Are you looking for a particular format, or it doesn't matter? So I would suggest text to MP3 format. So text to speech. Again, think of it as you were the student, what needs you would have. And you could spend some time with that student outlining what needs they specifically have. But in this case, it would be just a, a text to speech file, so an MP3 format. Now, I would say five to ten minutes is plenty of time for them to do those step-by-step -step guidelines. Okay? What do you think, AJ? Looking at the, the interface itself, how long do you think you would need to work that out? Five minutes. About five minutes. See, that's 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 an expected patient hours. I would say between five and ten minutes, a person with a little bit of guidance can go through the real real server and send off a request. Okay, so that's what I would suggest. However, please keep in mind that there will be some students that may not have the same level of digital literacy. Okay, so we always have to keep in mind. My two colleagues are very, very IT proficient. Okay, so they have been around numerous technologies. Whereas if you're dealing with a parent who is new to technology, that have a brand new shiny laptop that perhaps they've only used once and they type with two fingers, they will need a little bit more support. Okay? Now, that level of support, you can either do it there and then or suggest that you could take it offline and do it separately. What you do not want to do is hold up the majority of your class. And that's for you as educators and teachers to think of as well. You want the whole class to move at the same stage. Okay, so at this stage, I would presume that our students, having gone around and checked my 25 students in the class, that they have done that task, okay, and see if there are any challenges. And I would suggest there should not be any challenges using this particular technology. So the request is sent off, and what you could always remind yourself to do is to check in your emails in the next five or ten minutes to see if you receive it. Okay, and at that stage, you can then use that link that you're having to secure it to your device, or then to transform that onto your, your iPhone or your Android device or any device that you want to be able to study on the go. Okay, so that's what I would suggest. You have then the ability to take that with you. Okay, and that's where the benefit of this type of technology comes in. Okay. Now, so I would close off that segment of the workshop once that you have established everybody has completed that particular task, that they have created an MP3 file that they can then put on their own devices. Okay, so you just need to keep that in mind. The second element or the second type of technology I would like you then to consider is the creation of mind maps. Now, again, always keep in mind that your audience may or may not be familiar with mind maps. So, you need to consider. So, you've got that back in less than five minutes. Fantastic. So, you can then decide where you want to put that. Okay? Now, what I would suggest is keep that email open and think about what other types of support that you can use as a flexible learner. Now, can anybody tell me, have they ever used or seen a mind map before? Yes. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Now, what mind maps do is they allow the user to visually represent a concept, a theory, an idea, a set of interrelated objects or ideas in one visual location. Okay? And the ideas are connected directly to one central theory or idea or element. And I'm going to give you a few examples. Okay, so we have here one example of a mind map created using a piece of technology called Inspiration. You can see that there's a name in the center and there's 
associated arms or legs outside of that. And what you can do with these types of technologies is you can have different colors, different subcategories, maybe images on top. And what it helps to do, it allows you to formulate a sketch pad in your mind of an idea. And if you look at that and you practice drawing at that in your own time, the theories and the literature would suggest that you can remember the association of colour, of place, and its relationship to a central idea. So that's the theories of why mind maps are very, very useful. And they are particularly useful for students who have a specific learning difficulty because the colours help them remember, the act of doing a mind map helps them make kinesthetically, and finally, it's not too wordy. If you've ever worked with students with dyslexia, you will be aware of the fact that a lot of words on a page, tightly grouped together, can scare them, can in some way intimidate them, which is why when they look at academic textbooks and they're this bloody thick, they can be off-put. Whereas if information is broken down into simple concepts, they can remember, just as well as everybody else, the exact same information. Okay, so if I'm teaching you as a supporter of students or as a parent, or as somebody interested in inclusive education, that's the real value of these types of technologies, that they help the students remember in different ways. There's a number of free mind maps available that you can use. Um, XMind, FreeMind, they're a software that you download, but there's also browser software that you don't need to download, that you can just click on the website and create um, mind maps on the go. And we're going to use that today. Because remember, in these types of workshops that we're designing, what we have found traditionally is that if there's downloading involved, it can be chaotic. Especially when there is server problems, it slows everything, especially if you've got 35 people downloading at the same time, it stops the clock. Whereas if you're in a browser, you use things instantaneously. So the second exercise I'd like you to consider is www.text2mindmap.com So that's what I'd like you to put into your browsers and we'll see how we exploit that. Now, what you'll notice as we go along, I am attributing marks or percentages to each activity. Activity 1 was worth 30% of the marks, whereby the student then demonstrates that they can create an mp3 file using PDF Word version, so that they know the skills associated with doing so. And the same is, is associated with this exercise. So learners will create a mind map of their favorite movies, books, and songs using text to mind map. Now, the reason why I've, I've suggested that particular mind map is that you have to assume people will not be prepared to create mind maps of a complicated project. But they can do mind maps of very simple things such as your favorite movies, your favorite books, or your favorite songs. Okay, so you give people options. You don't want people having to think too much as part of this workshop. You want them to demonstrate they can use the technology. So, if you're on text to mind, here is an example, and it's always a good idea to have examples of the types of technologies that you're using. So here's one example I prepared of text to mind mind map of books that I need to read. Okay, it's very, very simple. What you do is you'll see on the left hand side if you're on the website, you'll see that you can manipulate the words and change the words what you want. And what I've simply created is I've broken down books into different genres of what I want to read. Fantasy books, horror books, sci-fi books, thrillers, and that's it simply just for my own memory. Okay, you can do it for complicated projects such as what you need to study, what you need to remember, a new theory that you need to research. So what I want you to do is I want you to use the website. So if I'm the facilitator, the educator, I'll go around making sure that you're on the actual page and that you can then exploit these words and change them to whatever you want. I'm not on Facebook or something like that. No, not on Facebook. No, no. But that's the thing. Always remember, if you have young people in the room, there is always a chance of digital camera. I'm listening. I'm really listening, but I'm not listening. 
Okay, so if you're an instructor, an educator, teacher, and you're presenting this, no matter what age we are, always do a walk around the room. Always go around and make sure people are doing what they should be doing. And that can be quite challenging. Uh, quick question. Yes. The tools, the mind map tools, are they also part of uh, room <coughs> or those are different tools? No, they're simply, they're simply learning technologies, but they're incorporated okay. within this program um, as free accessible tools. Okay. What we tend to do is if it's free, it's good. Mm -hmm. But not only that, if it's free, it's good, and it's useful, then we like it. Okay, so we have to be critical of some things that we do. Okay, now, I would then expect students to play around with that particular mind mapping tool, and again, anywhere from five to ten minutes, it's easy to create a very simple mind map. And what you can do with that mind map then is you can copy the image, you can save the image as a PNG or some type of image file, and then you have it. But what you can always consider is you can have it anywhere. On your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop, on your desktop. So that when you are on the bus or on your couch and you're in bed, and you want to exploit that again, you have it with you. Always remember, the technologies that we look at, you can take them with you. Okay? The audio files, the image files, everything that we actually look at should be transportable. Now, having played around with that particular tool, and I encourage all of you to play around with that. It's very, very simple. Mm -hmm. You change the central topic to whatever you want to focus on. It can be your favorite books, your favorite films, your favorite songs, your favorite destinations. My favorite destinations, Dublin, Vienna, Rome, New York. Whatever you want to do, give people options. It's not about the content in this particular case, it's about what they can demonstrate of the technology. Now, what I would suggest is give people no more than five to ten minutes, ask them, are they happy, or do they have any questions about the technology? It's very simple, but is there anything that you need support in? Yes? No? Good? Uh, the only thing I'm thinking about yes. in this context yes. is perhaps uh, providing a specific something for people to write about as opposed to reading it. You know, for example, in the first case, you gave, yeah, you gave, you gave an example of books. Mm -hmm. In this case, say, it could, if you, your students are on a particular topic, it could be it is writing about a literature review, yes. so that could it be. is put into context. You could do that. Not from, not just a tool, but in yeah. the context. Basically, it makes a con the tool and context. I get what you mean. Now, consider, you may be presenting to students that are in college. You may be doing so, but you may also be presenting to parents of students, or to new educators, or to new um, accessible format creators. So you might not always be a student in this case. But I take what you mean. You have to you yeah, have to context. you have to yeah. you have to play to your audience. Yeah. In this case you are playing the role of a student that may be in an NCI or it may be elsewhere. So you can have a generic template or a very focused one depending on who you're talking to. It's a really excellent point. Okay. So I would say at this stage you have created a simple mind map. You could then exploit it and copy and paste it or save it. And what I would then do is go around the room and make sure everybody has done that. Okay, so they've saved the file or they've created a file. Okay, now, as a lecturer, as a teacher, as an educator, get to know the audience and temperature of the room. If you have people and they're doing this or they look confused, you go over and you just go, how did you find it? Is it useful? Is it okay? And always remember, that's just one tool. Don't always just rely on one tool. Give people options. As we've seen earlier, they can download other mind maps, but in their own time. You do not want to hold up your class downloading stuff. What you could, however, do is you could give them a list of things to download before your class, but that requires a bit more preparation. So you have options. Always remember your options. Okay, so we're moving along now to the next topic. Now, what we have seen so far is you can create... Yes, please. Good question. Yes. Uh, 
I'm thinking as a student. Did you want a particular output for this exercise that you be marked? So what you would do is you would, as a facilitator, the educator, whatever, you'd go around the room and you'd make sure your student has completed that task. That they've either saved the image or they've copied the image into the into a Word document. So you'd have to go around and make sure everybody has done that. And you take it off. So do you want us to do that now? Well, as part of the demonstration, I, I don't need to do that. No, but if you were doing it in real life, you would make sure everybody has done that. Because you would then give them a mark for doing so. You have to give them the mark for doing so. That's because you're meeting the learning outcomes of that. So once you see a completed file, they've taken they've meant that learning outcome. Keep it simple. Okay, don't give them too many tasks to do in one particular session. Mind map, audio file, and then combine them. You give people more options. So the last one I would suggest doing is creating a visual and auditory learning experience such as narrating a PowerPoint file. Has anybody ever narrated a PowerPoint file before? Yeah? So it's again, it's, it's the same thing. So how many marks are we getting for this? For this particular exercise? For, for this exercise. <laughs> so every, every, Who every... Who would be happy students? You would be happy students. So it goes back, it goes back to how we designed the course. So you can design this as a one-day event, or you can design it as a long-term event. For this particular workshop, you have 100 marks, and those 100 marks are broken up into a series of events. For instance, this one here, I think, uh, I think it's 25% for this particular exercise. And it's to create and narrate a PowerPoint file. So what you would then do is ask them to open up Microsoft PowerPoint. And you go around and check and make sure everybody has that capability. Now, you have a few options when you're doing this. You can show them slides of how you narrate a PowerPoint, or you can actually go in and narrate it with them. It depends on whether you're in a lab scenario, or if you have the capability for everybody wearing headphones. Again, I'll leave that up to yourselves to decide on your audience. What I would suggest is show them how to do it, and perhaps get them doing it in their own time. Because if you have 25 people narrating at the same time, your noise levels go up and it becomes a little bit messy. Okay, so just give them the step-by-step -step process of how what to do. Okay, so what you're looking for, when you have, you can open up any example PowerPoint presentation, because I would bet again my house that you would have a presentation here and a presentation there of anything. Okay, so it doesn't have to be, again, one that you've created, but simply that you have on your laptop itself. So you're opening up a presentation, or even a blank presentation, it doesn't have to be, even have content. But what you're going to is the tab that you're called Slideshow. You're clicking into the tab called Slideshow. And what you'll notice then is a drop down menu. Okay, so click on Slideshow, drop down menu. And you'll notice a tab called, or not a tab, but a function called Record Narration. So you'd be looking to record narration on your presentation itself. So you simply click on that, and what I'll do now is I will demonstrate that in action. So, slideshow. Record slideshow. You can have options. You can record from the beginning, or you can record from a specific slide. And again, you give your students the options. You only want them to demonstrate that they can do it once. They don't need to narrate seven or eight slides, only that they can do it for one slide. So I would get them to narrate it or to demonstrate they know the processes involved in narrating them. And, and what you would require in order to get the 25% is that they would have to upload or in a later stage present you with an array of files. Does that sound fair? Okay, so it would only be, say, five or six slides, but that they have narrated over those slides. So that they're demonstrating they can maneuver slides, create slides, and talk over them, okay? Now, if you are doing this particular exercise as part of a workshop, it would require about, say, 15 minutes. Because what you'll notice when people are recording, people make mistakes. Okay, so you have to, you have to account for human error. People go, ah, I don't like that, and they restart it and you do it all over again, okay? So if it was to be part of this particular workshop, it would be about 15 minutes. But keep in mind 
People get anxious. You do not want a three hour workshop because people's energy levels go downhill. There's no sugar, they get bored, they get distracted. So try to keep things manageable. I would personally say if you're going above an hour, you in that hour you have to have exercises, you have to have them reflecting and to give you some feedback. After that they just lose motivation. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Yeah. So I would assume that they would take that exercise offline. I would trust that my students would do that offline once they know the steps involved. So do you think, based on what we described, and if I'm going around the room showing you the step-by-step -step processes, that you could narrate a slide or a few slides on PowerPoint? Do you know if there is, because uh, usually I find with uh, Microsoft uh, or other versions, Tend to default. Do you know if that is a problem in, in this case that should be pointed out? No, there's, there's a narrate function on every Microsoft from 2003 upwards. Okay. So no matter what version you have, there'll always be a narration tab. But it might come up in a different way, which yeah. is good. It's a really good point. Yeah. You have to check for different versions, but in every case it should be fine. Okay. Okay? So you would give them the instructions. And you would just make sure that you would have, if you were doing this as part of a university course, they would upload it onto a virtual um, learning system like Moodle or Blackboard. Or if you're doing this as part of one of our own local workshops, that they would give you a copy of the slides at a later stage. And you just tick the box that they've created and done so. And that would be your exercise. Okay, so you would assume that they now know how to narrate a slide, and you would give them reusable content such as a handout as well. Now, the final exercise that we're going to do, so keep in mind the energy levels in the room. You want them to start getting a bit more active. Okay, so they're after sitting there for nearly an hour. So either hydrate, get some sugar into you, or do something a little different. Which is why I'm moving my focus over to my colleague Eva to suggest that we move into the fourth exercise and the third part of our triangle, which is kinesthetic learning. Okay, and at this stage your students are going, what are you talking about? However, I have your slides, or do you can have that too? Better it is, perfect. Okay, so we're going to do a quick switch over, and we're going to look at, I'm not going to spoil it, I'm going to let Eva describe what she's going to do. You can do it later. We can do it later. Okay. Alright, so let's... Thank you.